Well, as you know, we talk a lot about freedom here, the Locke Foundation, and one of the areas is energy freedom. It's our goal, and we hope to get started at the legislature this session, moving into 2017, kind of setting the stage for lowering your electric bill and uh, providing a little bit more uh, freedom and opportunity for you, including repealing the renewable portfolio standard. That, of course, forces utilities to buy higher cost, less reliable renewable energy. That's added $276 million to North Carolina electric bills since that mandate took effect in 2008. That's just one of our energy-related goals. One of our good friends, uh, Donald Bryson from Americans for Prosperity, North Carolina, is also very interested in the uh, energy issue, and he's here to talk a little bit about it today. Donald, I think many of you know, you see him, have seen him around for many years. Before he became state director for AFP, uh, he was a field coordinator for the AFP Foundation, so he's been in grassroots activism for a number of years now. He was also a policy specialist with a school choice organization, Parents for Educational Freedom in North Carolina, our friends as well. So today, to talk to us about freeing the grid, energy politics in North Carolina, please welcome Donald Bryson. Before I worked for Parents for Educational Freedom, I, um, I interned at the Pope Center for Higher Education Policy, so it's, it's all very incestuous. But uh, I would drive by this building every day, and uh, I always wanted to work at the John Locke Foundation. And now I actually work at the John Locke Foundation. My office just happened to be downstairs. So I'm happy to be at this building. But um, energy is going to be a very important issue in North Carolina, uh, not just in the legislative session, not just in the past legislative session, but going on even into November. Uh, North Carolina is not a traditional um, energy state uh, such as Colorado or Virginia or West Virginia or Kentucky where energy is hotly debated, uh, but the demographics are changing in such a way and the policy debates are changing in such a way that uh, energy is going to be a big deal in North Carolina and as a matter of fact late last week I saw the first attack ads against Governor McCrory come out talking about uh, his stance on solar energy. Uh, I, I tried to take a look and see who the ad was done by, but I didn't see it. I haven't been able to find it since, but I did see the ad. Uh, if I had to take a hunch, I would say it would be the League of Conservation Voters, but we'll see. But uh, North Carolina is affected on, uh, on two different levels on energy policy. There's the state level, which we'll get to in the later part of the presentation, and there's the federal level. Um, particularly on the federal level over the last year, uh, the Obama administration has tried in several different ways to um, sort of put that administration's philosophy on energy out onto the states. Uh, there was the talk of cap and trade early on in the, in the administration. There's always been these incentive deals and ta uh, tax credits and tax packages. Uh, what we uh, in the freedom movement would other, what otherwise call uh, corporate welfare. We all remember what happened with Solyndra. Uh, and yeah, <laughs> I heard somebody laugh. Uh, it's funny on the one hand, on the other hand, it's billions of dollars that have gone down the drain for a company that was bankrupt that was basically bankrolled by uh, the American taxpayer. But what is the President's energy vision? Uh, of course, candidate Obama back in 2008 said that under his uh, plan, electricity rates would necessarily skyrocket. He's been very unapologetic about that ever since then. And then after uh, uh, groups like Americans for Prosperity and Freedom Works and other groups got after cap and trade and really attacked it very hard. You can't really talk about cap and trade in Washington, D.C. in polite company anymore. But President Obama rest assured that uh, Cap and trade was just one way to skin the cat. There are a few different ways that they're trying to get after, uh, you know, sort of putting on the, the leftist energy policy at the federal level. They had a few different tactics. Uh, there was obviously cap and trade and the Department of Energy loan guarantees. There's tax credits, the renewable fuel standard, that we have to have uh, certain levels of uh, basically homegrown <coughs> ethanol put into our fuel. Uh, and then the renewable energy portfolio standards, which the federal government has been pushing at the state level. Uh, then IRS got its new federal regulations, which we'll talk about in just a second, and then international agreements. And by that, we're talking about the Paris climate talks that happened over the past few months. Now, I will say there happens to be a solar bubble. We talked about Solyndra a little bit ago with the loan guarantees and uh, different tax credits and things like that. But there, uh, there does appear to be a larger bubble going on with large-scale solar companies uh, that are being fed lots and lots of sub subsidies by the federal government. We talked about Solyndra, that happened a few years ago, but since then, actually these, both of these just happened over the last week. 
a really large renewable energy company named Abengoa, which is a Spanish-owned company, has received hundreds of millions of dollars in subsidies from the federal government, has filed for uh, bankruptcy in the United States. And then Sun Edison, which is up until uh, probably the last two weeks has been viewed as a darling of Wall Street and has been one of the most popular uh, solar companies to uh, invest in on Wall Street, is probably going to file bankruptcy within the next day or so if they don't file it today. Uh, but you'll see that was April 1st and March 29th. And so um, there there's, it does appear to be a larger bubble. Uh, if you read into these articles and try to figure out what's going on with the energy markets, uh, what appears to be happening is that a lot of these renewable energy companies are being uh, basically priced out of the market due to cheaper coal and natural gas production thanks to the fracking boom here in the United States. But Obama's new regulatory regime, they're throwing everything at the states and they're throwing everything at the American taxpayer. Uh, regional haze rules, mercury standards, they're even putting new standards on wood burning stoves. So not only are they putting regulations on the power grid to drive up energy costs, but then if you're a poor family, say down in southeastern North Carolina who wants to heat your home through another means other than electricity, they're putting new standards on the wood burning stove that you would otherwise heat your home with. So you're going to pay it one way or the other. Uh, thankfully, Congressman David Rouser from the North Carolina 7th Congressional District has filed legislation to roll back the new standards on wood-burning stoves. But um, uh, for an administration that tries to say they're trying to help the least of these and they're trying to help the working poor and middle-income uh, Americans, um, their energy policy surely doesn't reflect that sort of philosophy. Ground level uh, ozone reduction, there's navigable waters that the EPA is uh, claiming those powers under the Clean Water Act. And actually the state of North Carolina tried to do sort of the same thing uh, over the last few years regarding the uh, Alcoa Dam out in the western part of the state. You may remember a lot about that. I believe Carolina Journal covered a good bit of that story. And then there's the really fancy one the Obama administration calls the Clean Power Plan. Uh, but it's the EPA Section 111D rulemaking. So what is it? Basically, they're trying to limit CO2 emissions, uh, and they're trying to create a specific plan or mandate a specific plan for each state, but not every state is created equally. States are treated differently under the Clean Power Plan. In North Carolina, uh, we're going to have to cut our emissions by 32.1% by the year 2030. That's cutting emissions by a third. Uh, that's a good bit. That's a good bit for a state that uh, produce, of the power that's produced in the state, 48% comes from coal-fired plants. That's a lot of emissions that we're going to have to cut, and that's a lot of people's electricity rates that are going to have to go up. Uh, and this gets at the crux of why North Carolina is going to be at the center of the energy debate nationally. Other states are, might be more important, I get that, but we're going to be snuck into this as well, uh, simply because we get so much power from coal, and we're one of the hardest-hit states under the Clean Power Plan. Now, this is, uh, is taken from uh, congressional testimony from uh, Lawrence Tribe. He was a Harvard Law professor, longtime mentor of the uh, president. But he questions greatly whether or not the EPA actually has the power to uh, you know, claim these powers under the Clean Air Act and implement the 111D rule and you know, try to limit emissions and basically regulate the power grid in each individual state. He said burning the Constitution not, should not become part of our national energy policy. I think it's a fair statement. Right? I mean, <laughs> if you're going to be part of the federal government, you should at least pay, play by the rules of the federal government, which is the Constitution. Uh, and I don't know, I mean, there are a lot of questions about does the EPA actually have the power under the Clean Air Act? If they do have the power under the Clean Air Act, are they getting into re uh, regulating intrastate commerce? If, they, if they're doing that, and they likely don't have the power to do that under the Commerce Clause of the Constitution. Uh, th this is just massive federal overreach that even to the point that at least the United States Supreme Court has put a stay on the 111D rule at this point, thankfully. Uh, and it can't be implemented until it's figured out in court. Now, this still has to go through the D.C. Circuit Court. Uh, and then from there, it'll likely be challenged no matter how the D.C. Circuit rules and go on to the Supreme Court. And it'll have to be worked out there. And you'll probably see a decision from the Supreme Court somewhere probably mid-2018. So this is still a long fight yet to be had. But several states have bonded together. Well, let me back up. Several states have bonded together and gone into a suit against the EPA. Uh, 27 states, as a matter of fact. Now, North Carolina is unique among these states, and I'll get into that in a little bit, but let's look at what the Clean Power Plan actually is. It basically consists of four building blocks. I 
blocked out the last one because you can't actually mandate that people use ele less electricity. So let's look at the other three. There's efficiency at the plant level, making the plants more efficient, and I get that. Uh, there's in the increased use of combined cycle natural gas, combined cycle with coal, combined cycle with solar, combined cycle with something else. And then there's an increased use of renewable energy. Block number three is particularly interesting in North Carolina because we're the third uh, largest solar, produce, solar power producing state in the country. Uh, and you also have to keep this in the background that the clean power plan was done uh, at the same time as or was brought out just before the Paris climate talks and was to be presented at the Paris climate talks. And it was the worst kept secret in Paris that there were multiple multinational corporations of renewable energy corporations uh, in Paris at the climate talks basically telling international governments, hey, if you want to actually you know, get to the, your goals of cutting emissions, things like that, basically you're going to have to subsidize our companies and subsidize our industries to get there. Now, there are monstrous subsidies for all power sources in the United States, but the, power so the subsidies for renewable energy are particularly large. They're going to get particularly larger under the Clean Power Plan if states are forced to read these mandates. Now, this uh, graph on the left here, look, my pointer works. Uh, on the left, electricity generation by fuel, you'll see renewables are here at about 18%, and that's fine. Uh, nothing wrong with renewables, nothing wrong with coal or natural gas or anything like that. Uh, but what we do know is that renewables receive uh, per kilowatt hour, in terms of per kilowatt hour produced, the subsidies are massive when compared to coal, oil, and natural gas. Now, when you break that out even more, you'll notice that uh, the ones that are subsidized the highest are wind and solar. Wind actually produces a good bit of power, solar not so much. Hydropower, the one that actually is produced the least and is actually limited under our state's renewable energy portfolio standard, uh, produces by far the most power of the national portfolio in renewable electricity generation. This is, we'll go through this pretty quickly, but uh, uh, we, we can expect a DC Circuit decision in July 2016. Uh, eventually we'll get to about March 2018, hopefully get to a, a US Supreme Court decision and then we can figure out if there's a clean power plan that states are going to have to phase into or not after that. Under the 111D rule, uh, Energy Adventures analysis did some, uh, some analysis state by state. In North Carolina, it looks like the combined uh, average electricity and natural gas bill for the average North Carolina household is going to increase by about $434 per year. That's, that, that's, a, that's half a mortgage payment for some people. That's a couple of car payments for some people. That's $434 a year that a lot of people can't afford. Now, some of you all, Terry Stoops, for instance, $434 is not anything. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, for low-income, middle-income families, $434 is a lot of money. Uh, think about if you're, if you're someone who, you're, if you're the single mother bringing in $25,000 a year, uh, $434 is a big chunk of change. That, 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 that's literally you know, money you could put towards a mortgage or a car payment or even more so groceries towards feeding your family. That's problematic and it's something that clearly the Obama administration and uh, people pushing this sort of energy policy are not thinking about uh, when you go forward. And even when you look at the polling on clean energy and renewable energy, uh, what you find is that higher income individuals understand that it's going to cost more money and they're okay with paying the increased cost but it's the lower income individuals that will get hit the hardest and they understand that as well. And it's something about the demographic shift in North Carolina that uh, uh, people in political circles really need to start paying attention to. Uh, this goes out into EVA's analysis even more. You can see that the average national gas bill, natural gas, not national gas, we're not gonna nationalize natural gas. Uh, in North Carolina it's gonna go up by about 48%, electricity about 10%, it's combined $434 for about a 22% increase. Uh, industrial rates get hit with about a 26% increase, so not only is your power bill going to go up, but the goods that you're trying to buy with your now limited amount of cash are going to go up as well because the electricity that it costs to produce them, in fact, goes up as well. Uh, this is a little hard to read, but the capital investment that's going to be required for North Carolina to meet the 111D rule, if it's fully, fully implemented, is about $2.44 billion dollars 
there in North Carolina, which coincidentally is about the same size as the tax cut we passed in 2013. So if we could just repeal that, put all the money back into the 111D, we're all square, right? I'd rather keep my own money. Uh, and then wholesale electricity prices, this reiterate, uh, reiterates what I was saying earlier, a 23.7% increase in North Carolina. Uh, other states are not hit nearly as hard. Like I said, it doesn't treat every state equally. But uh, states like Pennsylvania, Kentucky, West Virginia, Ohio, Indiana, they're all hit pretty hard. Uh, it's also cold country. Uh, common consequences, I think that's pretty self-evident. You're going to have higher energy costs, uh, costs, lower economic growth due to higher energy costs. Um, you know, companies have a set amount of overhead. They're going to have to pay their energy bill eventually if they're going to manufacture or produce goods. It means they're going to have less money to actually hire people. It's fairly simple accounting. Uh, Grid reliability will be interesting to see how that's, uh, how that's impacted. Uh, there's very little accountability to the EPA once this is put in place. And then states will definitely lose control to Washington. Now, Washington is trying to sell this to the states that, uh, well, you can put in your own plan uh, that conforms with, uh, with the 111D rule. But really, you as a state legislature or as a state department of environmental quality, you get to build your own plan which is much the same argument that the Obama administration used with building the state exchanges on Obamacare. Uh, yeah, you could create a state exchange, but it has to come in with these certain set of rules. Well, essentially, the Obama administration has already set the rules for what the state exchanges need to look like. They've already set the rules for what the power plants need to look like for each individual state. We're essentially losing control. Now, the threat, much like the state exchanges, is that if the state doesn't come up with a plan, uh, then the, you know, Department of Energy or the EPA will come in and create the state's plan uh, from the federal side. Again, we're losing control to the federal level. This is a, th make no mistake about it, uh, they can candy coat it as much as they want, but this is a federal takeover of the electrical market in North Carolina. All pain, no gain. Now let's say that we buy into, uh, I'm not a climatologist, I'm not a scientist, I'm not an economist for that matter. But uh, let's say we buy into the climate science of why we need to do this. Uh, well, uh, under the best analysis that we've been able to find, global temperature increase, uh, if just the United States implements the Clean Power Plan, will be mitigated by 0 0.016 degrees Fahrenheit by 2050. I'm going to fill that one. And then we're going to mitigate sea level rise by 1 one-hundredth of an inch, uh, which is about the thickness of three sheets of paper. Woo! Calm your excitement down. So how does the Supreme Court stay on the 111D rule impact North Carolina? Most important thing is that EPA cannot require that North Carolina submit a plan. It also uh, further empowers North Carolina to make its own decision about what the grid should look like. And North Carolina no longer faces the threat of a federal plan until we get a Supreme Court decision. What can North Carolina legislators do? They could put in their own processes, add transparency to the process. They should connect with AFP North Carolina and get some advice about what, what good policy is. Also talk to the John Locke Foundation. Uh, but we should partner with states, attorney generals, and federal lawmakers to actually come up with good policy, try to lo roll back the 111D rule, and fight the EPA. Now, I said earlier that North Carolina is unique among the 27 states suing the EPA because we are the only state that is not represented in the lawsuit by our attorney general. Uh, the General Assembly and Governor McCrory had to pass a bill that actually required the Department of Environmental Quality to seek its own outside counsel and join in the lawsuit in that way because our Attorney General came in and has endorsed the carbon rule under the EPA. And you can see we're citing stories from the Raleigh News Observer and the Asheville Citizen Times. But basically, Roy Cooper, uh, he literally sent a letter to the General Assembly to all lawmakers and to Governor McCrory and told them to basically they should acquiesce to the 111D rule and go along with what the Obama administration wants. And he has given in to his cronies in the Obama administration. Uh, th this is not political grandstanding that I'm doing here. I'm telling you what he did. He wrote a very public letter. It was, publicly, it was covered by a lot of news sources in North Carolina. And he basically has told the state of North Carolina to roll over and let it happen. This is the guy who's supposed to be the attorney for the state. He's supposed to protect North Carolina consumers and protect the interests of the state of North Carolina. And instead, he said, roll over and let this encroachment of federal power happen. So North Carolina has created its own little green energy boondoggle over the last few years uh, through a variety of ways. There are three uh, major policies that North Carolina has. 
Uh, one was a renewable energy investment tax credit. Uh, the first part of the, that tax credit, uh, despite what detractors will say, has been in place since 1978. Um, it has changed over time because they always let it sunset and they, when it's about to sunset they let it come back in and change it. The latest iteration of that uh, was passed in 2009 when that was pushed up to a 35 percent uh, tax credit for renewable energy investment. <clears throat> then in 2007, uh, the North Carolina General Assembly and Governor Mike Easley, our former governor slash felon, Mike Easley, uh, passed uh, Senate Bill 3, which had a really long and innocuous name, but it basically created a, uh, a renewable energy portfolio standard, which means that over time, uh, utility providers in North Carolina have to provide increasing amounts of electricity produced from renewable energy sources, so that by January 1st, 2021, 12.5%, or one-eighth of all electricity produced in North Carolina, has to come from a finite list of renewable energy sources. And then, last but not least, solar energy in North Carolina, uniquely solar, not wind, not biomass, not anything else, but uniquely solar, has an 80% property tax exemption in the state. So that um, they're, they're literally only paying 20% of the property taxes for the capital investments they're putting in. Um, this is a problem uh, because we really need to clean up our tax code. This isn't as much of an energy problem as we have to have a cleaner tax code. And that's why AFP fought to get rid of the Renewable Energy Investment Tax Credit, but also this property tax thing is, it's bizarre to me. Um, you know, let's suppose that I wanted to start a trucking company in North Carolina. We have to move goods back and forth. Trucking, I think we can all agree, is needful to the economy, but I don't think the state of North Carolina would give me an 80% property tax exemption on all the trucks that it would take for me to start a trucking company in North Carolina. I don't know why the, uh, you know, the solar energy industry uniquely, and again, they're the only renewable energy industry that gets this unique property tax exemption in North Carolina. Now, the Renewable Energy Investment Tax Credit expired on December 31st, uh, 2015. It is now gone. Uh, there was a safe harbor bill that was passed so that people that were under 50% construction for their investments uh, would be able to reap that tax credit for I think it was three to five years going forward. Uh, the uh, Fiscal Research Division at the General Assembly quoted that that tax credit may cost the state about $184 million over the next 10 years. Carolina Journal did a really interesting article. You'll see there below the fold. I don't know why it made it below the fold, Don. <laughs> but it's going to, well, uh, you, I guess you did write that one, didn't you? Uh, uh, it's going to cost taxpayers uh, just under $1 billion. I think it was about $984 billion in potential tax credits that could be claimed back from the state. Um, one, how did, we miss, <laughs> how did we miss that? How did we go from $184 million to nearly $1 billion? Uh, the second thing is um, no other industry gets this. Uh, tax credits, uh, particularly corporate tax credits, are corporate welfare, period. Uh, a lot of people uh, will try to say, well, tax credits are actually tax cuts and that they reduce, they reduce the uh, tax burden on particular companies. And that's true, they do. But at that point, it's the government literally picking, you get a lower burden, you don't. You get a lower burden, you don't. You get a lower burden, you don't. Uh, and it's literally government picking winners and losers at that point. And if, it's the, point, if the point is to create some sort of uh, economic incentives or economic development, then the people who are pushing for tax credits have already conceded the argument that a lower tax burden creates jobs and creates economic development. So if it does that for one industry, why can't it do that for all industries? So instead of the government literally being able to pick this industry special and this one's not, how about we just say, hey, we kind of like everybody being able to get back to work and let's lower taxes for everybody and move to a true or flat tax system rather than picking solar over wind over coal over natural gas. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, AFP has been fair, not fairly consistent. We've been very consistent uh, on this in, in North Carolina for pushing to get rid of all tax credits, not just for re renewable energy, but also for film, uh, also for motorsports fuels, also for airline fuel. Uh, it, if we're going to lower taxes, we need to lower taxes for everybody and stop picking winners and losers. Uh, but the problem comes down to simple math. See, this is $1 billion that are not being paid out in state revenues. In other words, that's $1 billion that... The state is okay with doing without, and we could have otherwise reduced everybody's tax burden by $1 billion. But instead, we picked these special guys over here. Then we created the Renewable Energy 
portfolio standard. And I just pulled out the, the general statute just to prove to you that it actually exists. Uh, you'll see that by uh, 2020, at the end of 2020, 12.5% of North Carolina retail sales and power. The problem is that is that little part right there, and thereafter. There are a lot of legislators that mistakenly believe that the, uh, the renewable energy portfolio standard, I'm going to say reps from now on because renewable energy portfolio standards takes too long to say. They believe that the reps actually sunsets, but it doesn't. So as the capacity for the grid in North Carolina grows, and as our population grows, and as we have to produce more and more electricity, we have to keep up with 12.5%. So that 12.5% means more and more kilowatts, more and more megawatts that we're having to produce in renewable electricity. Now, people on the other side, proponents of re the renewable energy industry and, and the reps in North Carolina will say, but, 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 we create jobs. Okay, fine. The Department of Environmental Quality, formerly the Department of Environmental, uh, Environment and Natural Resources, put out a study in March of last year, a snapshot of North Carolina's energy portfolio, seven years after Session Law 2007-397. And that noted that the LeCapper study, which was another study that they referenced, at higher rate impact levels, the job losses from higher total cost of electricity across the state may exceed the jobs gained through renewables development. Let me break that down for you. The renewable energy industry has, or had, and still do to an extent, an investment tax credit. They have a renewable energy portfolio standard that requires utilities and thereby ratepayers to buy their product in increasing amounts over time. And then solar energy also has an 80% property tax exemption. If you can't create jobs with those three things in place, you don't know how to run a business. So yes, you darn well better be creating jobs. I'm not stunned that the renewable energy uh, industry in North Carolina has created jobs. They better be creating jobs. But what we're finding is that, yes, they're creating jobs, but the opportunity costs that the state is, ha is being impacted by due to the higher electricity prices that are impacting our ag sector and our manufacturing sector and our commercial sector is actually hurting overall job numbers in that we have lost more jobs than we have gained through renewable energy investment. Now they'll go on to say, but, 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 lower prices. One, that's silly. But what did the Department of Environmental Quality, again, this is the Department of Environmental Quality talking in an official study that they released. This isn't, this isn't, you know, citizens against renewable energy. This isn't Americans for Prosperity doing this study. This is a state-funded study. North Carolina remains the only state in the southeast to, to have enacted a reps. Fine. As a result of this geographic isolation, long-term energy prices may adversely impact economic growth and challenge recent improvements in employment in North Carolina. So we can cut taxes all we, on, all we want, but those, the job growth numbers we're going to see by lower taxes and other economic developments in North Carolina are going to be mitigated by the geographic isolation and all the long-term energy price impacts from the renewable energy portfolio standard. Power rates. Now, the renewable energy folks will go on and tell you that North Carolina has some of the lowest rates in the country, and they're 100% right about that. We do have some of the lowest rates in the country. But what this slide will tell you and what this study will tell you is that our rates are actually growing at a faster rate than the regional and national averages. So that our rates in North Carolina have increased by 20%. During the same time, the average residential electricity rates in the South Atlantic in the U.S., 20%, rose 14% and 15% respectively. Now I'm going to break out my third grade math because I went to public school. 20% is greater than 14%. And 20% is greater than 15%. The cost of energy efficiency, demand side management, and the renewable energy programs are passed onto the customer in the form of a rider. Now, how many of you look at your power bill every month? I mean, other than just pay it. A lot of you may have noticed, oh, good for you. I'm glad you pay your power bill. Uh, a lot of you may have noticed uh, that there'll be a fee tacked on past what your base rate is, and it'll say REPS rider fee or renewable energy rider fee or something like that. So you, what the state understood when they passed Senate Bill 3 back in 2007 was that renewable energy costs more to implement than traditional energy sources. Fine. But they're allowing utilities in the state to, create, to tack on a rider fee to help them recoup costs for having to keep up with the renewable energy standard. 
mine last November was the last time I, I actually sat down and looked at it because my wife pays our bills. But when I looked at it, it was 83 cents. 83 cents. Doesn't sound too bad, right? But then you take 83 cents times 6.5 million households times 12 months out of the year, and you're looking at an economic impact just for residential. This isn't talking about con uh, commercial or industrial rider fees, which are much larger. The residential impact uh, of money taken out of the economy is about 36 to 42 million dollars a year. That's a significant chunk of change. Uh, that, that, that a lot of things could be done <laughs> with that amount of money. Um, so yeah, we're kind of getting shafted with the rider fee. Now, they'll continue to say power rates, but we keep power rates down. But Duke Energy, and, and I'll be very clear, I'm not a Duke Energy apologist, and we'll get to why I'm not a Duke Energy apologist here in a little bit. But Duke Energy made this great announcement back in late November of last year where they said that power rates are going to go down, they're going to apply with the Utilities Commission for power rates to go down. However, they are applying for an increase in the charge to customers for the utilities compliance with the state's renewable energy portfolio standard. Why? Because compliance with the re renewable energy portfolio standard is very expensive. The increase to the reps charge, and this is directly from the Duke press release, the energy to the reps charge reflects increases in actual and projected compliance costs driven by the increase in the utility's overall compliance obligation. Pretty black and white, right? Now, what they will say on the other side is one, that Duke Energy has AFP in the bag and that they are major donors to AFP. I want to make it very clear that Americans for Prosperity has never received a red cent from Duke Energy. But they'll also say that the reps has actually increased competition. And no wonder Duke's complaining about the reps because it, it hurts their competition and hurts their, their uh, supply in the market. So we're going to play a little game. I need everybody to get involved with me. So how many of you were paying power bills in 2007 in North Carolina? Great. Fantastic. How many of you are paying, uh, paying your power bill to a new energy provider in North Carolina? No, not a soul. If you were paying to Duke or Progress Energy in 2007, you were paying to Duke Energy now. If you were paying Electricities back then, you're paying to Electricities now. If you were paying the TVA or Dominion Power, you're paying Dominion Power now. They have an increased competition in the electrical market in North Carolina. All they've done with requiring the reps is for you to pay for their product. See, they, they've required now that major utilities buy their product, therefore you have to buy it. Competition hasn't increased at all. Duke Energy is still a monopoly in North Carolina. And combined, Duke Progress was a monopoly in North Carolina. They're just now requiring them to buy their product. And that's all it is. And that's why this is corporate welfare and crony capitalism at its worst. So, what should the state of North Carolina not do? And here's where I get to talking about how AFP's legislative agenda on this has changed a little bit. Uh, we should not reinstate the renewable energy tax credit. That does not help increase competition and its corporate welfare, and it's terrible. We should not increase the size and scope of the renewable portfolio standard. We shouldn't increase what re uh, renewable energy is. We shouldn't expand that definition, and we shouldn't increase from 12.5% to 18% or 20% or 30%. We should not create, as was uh, recommended by the Department of Environmental Quality, to create a clean, portfolio, a clean energy portfolio standard, where the Department of Environmental Quality and some other lawmakers wanted to put in and just basically add nuclear and natural gas to the reps and call it a clean energy standard. That is not the answer. Do not do that. A mandate is a mandate is a mandate, and mandates are bad. Don't require people to buy particular products. Stop it. We should also not create incentives and tax credits for natural gas and, and nuclear energy. Uh, Americans for Prosperity is opposed to all tax credits and incentives and subsidies for any, any energy source. Now the other side always says, but, 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 the Koch brothers. One, that's obnoxious. Two, it's an ad hominem argument. You're not getting to the source of what my argument is, you're just attacking the source of the argument. And furthermore, we're very much on record opposing all subsidies for any, any energy source. Um, so this idea that we need to create more incentives and tax credits by using uh, state departments is silly. We should stop it. Here's what we should do. We should repeal the energy mandate, the, re the renewable energy portfolio standard at the state level. We should end all special tax loopholes and subsidies for any energy source. Uh, 
whether that's renewable energy, North Carolina actually, the only energy source that was actually getting subsidized through tax credit at the state level was renewable energy. Um, the other side always says, but, 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 coal and natural gas and oil all get subsidies from the, uh, from the federal government. That's exactly right. They do get subsidies from the federal government, and they shouldn't. But we're talking about state policy, and the state of North Carolina doesn't provide those subsidies. So let's get back to the argument and say that the state of North Carolina should end any of these tax credits and subsidies. Then we should legalize third-party leasing and sales. Uh, North Carolina is one of four states that uh, expressly prohibits uh, third-party sales in that if there is a renewable energy source outside of a legacy utility provider uh, that wants to sell power, let's say if a solar farm sets up next to my subdivision, they want to sell directly to those consumers, they can't do that under North Carolina law. Um, that's a little silly. Now, I think there are a lot of things that we need to get to to figure that out, but basically, if somebody has a product and the renewable energy people do have a product and there are people that want to buy the product, they should be able to do that. Now, what I think is the problem is that we've sort of flipped what the free market is on its head over the last little bit. Uh, so the other side claims, but this is the free market, this is the free market. We don't have a free market otherwise because Duke Energy has a monopoly. But the freeness, the, the essence and quality of being free that we like about the free market is not there to protect merchants, is it? We're not, it, the, the free market isn't there to protect the guy selling the stuff. It's there to provide choice and competition to help the guy who's trying to consume the stuff. And so uh, the idea that we've put in all this energy policy to create competition in the market is a good idea. The problem is that we haven't done that. All we've done is we've, we've basically mandated that the state and the utility providers in the state have to buy from these particular sets of merchants, and then we've given the shaft to the consumers. That's not a free market at all. Now, there's caveat with the third-party sales. Uh, we have to create a mechanism for contracts that will cover ramp up costs if there is any electricity from uh, solar power or any type of renewable power. Uh, at the time when that goes down because the sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't always blow, uh, there are increased ramp up costs that will hurt uh, or that will cause more demand to come from the utility legacy providers so that coal power plants and natural gas power plants are going to have to ramp up more. Uh, other states have been able to work this out, and I figure if South Carolina can figure out how to do these contracts, surely to God we can. Uh, but the state's going to have to create a mechanism when they implement third-party sales for these contracts to exist. They're also going to have to create a mechanism for net metering sales in such a way that uh, a wholesale rate can be negotiated between the uh, renewable energy providers and the utilities, and that there is not a state-mandated retail rate. Um, we should not do that. Um, the idea of net metering is that there is... Uh, electricity that eventually goes back to the grid. And in a lot of states, they require uh, the utilities to buy that power back at the retail rate. How many of you have owned a business where you sold a product? Okay, you didn't sell the product back, or you didn't sell the product for the cost that you bought it for, right? No, you marked it up. And so if we continue to buy, to uh, require utilities to sell power back at uh, or to buy it at the retail rate and then sell it back at the retail rate, they're eventually going to mark up that cost. It's going to be, going to be passed on to all consumers. So we're going to have to create a mechanism for what a wholesale rate is. But that's essentially my presentation. I'll take some questions. Uh, I, I think that's supposed to be how it's, uh, how it's done. I think the, the Energy Policy Council is supposed to review those things and then come back with some sort of a recommendation after that. But I think you're right. It's a long way what they're doing now. They've got all kinds of stuff in their mouth. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, sir. It's fine. You've written more on this than I have. Um, but the, the whole aspect of it is, I think, a really smart way from the renewable energy lobby of 
covering up the fact that they are going to be, that their, that their product is way more expensive. So essentially, they're arguing, we need this money, we need these incentives from the state, because we're going to create jobs. They're going to create jobs because their product is vastly more inefficient than the product that's out there. So there's going to be more jobs per megawatt hour in solar, in wind, than you're going to get in coal and natural gas and nuclear. Anyway, yeah. uh, there's a lot more behind that. No, that's fine. Uh, and, and by the way, uh, you should check out the John Locke Foundation website. Uh, John Sanders has done a phenomenal job writing on this issue. Uh, J John's done a lot of good work on this. Okay. A lot of you are tweeting in here, and people, we've got people following us, so thank you very much. Keep that up. And there has been some response on Twitter to the issue of, I think it's the $430. Uh -huh. Okay, help us understand more about the calculation of $430 and the cost to the average Sure, well, I mean, uh, the idea is... Basically, uh, you know, the, the four building blocks of the uh, of the clean power plan, and essentially what it, what if you take them all in total, is that we're going to have to produce more electricity from renewable energy sources, which are more expensive. Uh, we're going to have to uh, do a lot more uh, efficiency capacity at the plant level. That's basically what the two what the whole plan boils down to. Uh, creating efficiency is a good thing, I think, uh, particularly for uh, utility providers, but there's additional cost on that. We're going to have to put scrubbers on the smokestacks. We're going to have to figure out how to make the burners in natural gas plants more efficient. Uh, then there's the whole dual cycle thing where we're going to have to figure out how to make solar, burn or solar run during the day and natural gas run at night and that sort of thing. All of that costs a lot of money. It costs a good bit of money to come into compliance with those things, and so uh, for it, it, thereby those costs are going to have to get passed on from somewhere because there's no such thing as a free lunch. And so uh, Dominion Power and Duke Power are probably going to have to increase uh, their rates. Uh, and Piedmont Natural Gas, which has now been bought by Duke Power, is probably going to have to increase their rates because of all the new uh, combined cycle stuff. Plus there's going to be uh, a smaller amount of publicly available natural gas. It's more that's going to go to dual cycle uh, and be used for electricity as opposed to natural gas to heating our homes. Uh, and so uh, since there's smaller demand on that, or since there's greater demand on that, uh, natural gas prices will go up. And then for electricity, coming into compliance for all those things, that's going to drive prices up. And uh, the economic impact that it looks like for North Carolina is about $434 a month on average. Yes? Uh, we, we just passed the ninth most populous state. We're probably going to get to the seventh. Sure. What, what gets me is I'm more, I don't really care too much whether is a monopoly. All I care right. about is will the energy market be able to meet the demand? Mm -hmm. And will all this moving around of solar this and everything else, mm -hmm. I don't think that's uh, that's going to benefit us rather than let the energy you know, industry meet the demand. Mm -hmm. And you, you touched on it. One, one other thing about the amount of money we have to invest to get a small payback it ain't worth it. It's not like the 1980s. Right. I mean, it could cost 10 times as much to get as the payback we got years ago. Yeah. And it looks like we're, we're misguided with all of these incentives. And right. If, if someone has a solar farm, go for it. But not, you know, not with us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I see what you're saying. I, I completely agree with you. Uh, I, you know, I don't care. And, and for that matter, Duke Energy doesn't care where their power comes from. So Duke is guaranteed a particular rate of return or return on investment per kilowatt hour, right? So Duke doesn't care if their power comes from solar or natural gas or coal or wind or whatever. They just want customers buying the power. Um, but when you're trying to get a state back to work, uh, and we're the ninth most populous state, and uh, you know we created 181,000 jobs since we've implemented our tax reforms back in 20 back in 2013. Um, that's mo far more jobs created than any of our surrounding states. I think we've created about 140,000 more jobs in Virginia, 80,000 more than Georgia, 70,000 more than South Carolina. We're crushing other people, and people want to move here. But what we're trying to do is get things like manufacturing and agriculture get set back up in North Carolina. Great, we've lowered the tax burden. That in incentivizes a lot of people to come back in when you do that. But manufacturers are going to want reliable power. Uh, and you hear it said a lot, and the problem is it, it has the benefit of being true. The sun doesn't always shine 
wind doesn't always blow and so you always have sort of this risk of brownout if you don't have cheap and reliable energy and that's when you know things like those ramp up costs and things like that we're going to have to work in with the third party sales uh, and figure out you know how that can be supplemented and how the renewable energy uh, utility or the renewable energy companies as opposed to the utilities are going to pay for that because we don't want that passed on to the consumer yes sir You know, I think it's a fair question, uh, and the, the problem is you're going to get you get a lot of honesty. <laughs> if you don't get a lot of honesty in politics, is that I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I mean, the other side of the argument, uh, and uh, people from the renewable energy side will say, well, we don't have a free market anyway because you've got this monster utility that's guaranteed a rate of return, legally guaranteed a rate of return, and so we've got to figure out some way to get down the path of creating a freer market. And, and instead of mandate, my only point is, instead of mandating that people buy this particular type of energy or this particular type of energy, which I think is silly, we have to get to what is a least cost strategy. And you're going to hear me and a lot of legislators actually talk about a least cost strategy. Uh, I think you're making a fair, a fair point about that it's not necessarily a free market, but we've got to move to a place where we're getting to a freer market. Um, and you know, the other side has said that we haven't had a free market for a long time due to Duke's monopoly. But the, the answer to not a free market and a monopoly isn't a monstrous government regulation, right? And so I think if people are at least able to sell their wares, now, if they're able to sell their wares and nobody's buying, what difference does it make? Uh, which very well may be the case. But I, I think at least we have to get to a point where consumers can choose what's cheapest for them. Does that make any sense? I think I talked all around it, but I didn't have an answer for you. Yes, sir. Oh, I have no idea. I'm, I know. <laughs> I mean, I would love to know that, but I, I don't know. Um, I, I know there are a lot of people at the General Assembly in particular that really, 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 really want more nuclear within the state. Uh, nuclear is you know, very clean and large capacity energy. Uh, I think some. I think we have some of the prime sites on the East Coast for where a good nuclear reactor would, would go, particularly uh, down in like Davie County. But I don't know. I haven't heard anything about what they're going to do down at Harrison. Okay. Oh, St Stephanie, and, and then we'll get Rick as the very last one. Sure. It was just a monstrous disappointment. Uh, they. Um, I don't know, I kind of felt like uh, Charlie Brown hoping that Lucy was going to hold the football in place. Uh, because they, they had actually been um, very responsive with the McCrory administration and working to get more offshore drilling. Uh, I mean, you want to talk about something that would actually create a ton of jobs. Whether they receive subsidies or not, that's going to create a lot of jobs for uh, the coast of North Carolina, a place in North Carolina that could actually use a lot of jobs in economic development. Um, and then just all of a sudden, out of nowhere, they come up and literally pull the football away and you know, we're Charlie Brown going flying down the yard there. Um, no, it, it, it is, and, and we're trying to figure out sort of where they did it. And I think people on both sides, people that were opposed to it and people that were in favor of it, are both kind of scratched their heads like, where did this come from, why? My guess is that it has a lot to do with the political debates that are going to form in North Carolina later this year, uh, and Virginia for that matter, but we'll see. Rick? Uh, off topic question, but on topic radio. Okay. Sure. Uh, real quick, tomorrow the uh, Joint Legislative Administrative Procedure Oversight Committee, because they needed a longer name, uh, is considering draft legislation on occupational licensure uh, to, uh, one, require that the legislature further study the issue, uh, rein in some government regulations, and then get rid of about 15 licenses and licensure boards in North Carolina. I think there's a lot of debate that can be had about occupational licensure. I mean, you're going to have to be pretty darn libertarian. What are the people who, like, rig buildings for demolition, uh, I don't know what they're called, but I mean, you're going to be pretty darn libertarian to say those people don't need a license. But things like public librarians, 
uh, and hair braiders, um, acupuncturists, things like that. Like, why is the state in there? Uh, and why are we giving these people that are in private business the, the capacity to regulate this? It creates a, a state of uh, regulatory capture in which people can keep their own competition out of the marketplace. And it's a little ridiculous. Like, we're, we're regulating public librarians. We're licensing public librarians. Is the state afraid of roving bands of public librarians going around the state misplacing books? Uh, I mean, it's a little silly, isn't it? And, uh, and so we're hoping for a good debate tomorrow. I don't know what the committee is going to do. And again, it's just on draft legislation. But it's a debate that we want to have going forward. Because if you want to talk about getting low and middle income people back to work, this is a jobs program by literally letting them just, just go to work and getting government out of the way. And we look forward to it. Thanks for the question, Rick.